Hey, good morning. It's good to be with you this morning. I uh, hope you're having a great day. It's Tuesday, July 21st, and uh, it is a beautiful morning outside, a little overcast, uh, probably um, 80 degrees this morning when I woke up. And I am so excited to be with you today uh, because we're going to have a fun day today. So you're going to enjoy today, I hope. Maybe maybe not, but I'm going to enjoy today because it's going to be an awesome day. Uh, if you're joining us on Facebook, say hi. If you're joining us on YouTube, say hi and welcome to you. Um, just a few announcements that I have. Let me go back to my announcements here. Um, no birthdays today at all. So we had two yesterday, none today. I think I saw that there's some coming up tomorrow. So we'll point those out. And also, uh, this Sunday after worship will be a lot of fun. Uh, we're all going to dial into a Zoom call. You can call in with the telephone or you can call in with your computer and a camera. Uh, and then we're going to break apart into small groups. And we've got a couple fun activities. And uh, it should be a really, really great time. So I'm looking forward to that. So stay tuned for that on Sunday. And um, the other announcements I want to talk about, if you'll remember, when was this? Um, actually, I have it right here. It was uh, July 8th. I had just come back from uh, visiting my child and my grandchildren in Chicago. And somewhere along the line, I think as I was driving back or maybe when we got here, I found out that Arizona was the number one coronavirus uh, outbreak in the world. And I remember being freaked out about that because I just spent three weeks in Chicago and I came back because I figured Chicago was worse than Arizona. Uh, and all of a sudden I get here and I figure out or find out that from the New York Times that Arizona is the highest in the world. I'm like, what in the world is going on? And uh, if you remember, that was, um, I have the article right here. It says, uh, this is from July 8th, 2020, and it says there's no country in the world where confirmed coronavirus cases are growing more rapidly as they are in Arizona, Florida, or South Carolina. The Sun Belt has become the global virus capital. And I remember being freaked out by this. Um, the chart ranks the countries, and here you have Arizona. This is number of coronavirus cases per million residents in the last seven days. Uh, and it shows that, you know, we have three points. We're, we're just killing it. I mean, if this were a contest you wanted to win, you know, there'd be no, there'd be no contest. We'd be, well, don't, I shouldn't say killing it. All right. We'd be, we'd be at the top. All right. Uh, the only countries with outbreaks as severe as those across the Sun Belt are Bahrain, Oman, and Qatar. Three Middle Eastern countries with large numbers of low-wage migrant workers who are not citizens. I have no idea. Am I, I must be. Am I in the same story? <laughs> Hold on. Um, yeah. All right. Only countries with outbreaks as severe as those uh, with large numbers of low-wage migrant workers who are not citizens. So I guess... That has something to do with the outbreak. Is that something to do with Arizona too? I don't know. Anyway, so um, we were number one, and it was reported by the New York Times. Of course, the you know it's the newspaper of record for the United States. Uh, if you want to know anything about the world, you go to the New York Times, and you you know that that's you know they've got really really good people um, trying to get to the truth. But uh, so I want to just go back to the Arizona Department of Health Services website. So that was on. July, I'm going to look back, July 8th. And if you go to the Arizona Department of Health Services website um, and you go to confirm coronavirus cases per day and you go to July 8th, um, let's see, July 8th is right here. July 8th, um, yeah, we had 2,938 cases, but as you can see, it was kind of on a downward trend, and it has been on a downward trend ever since. So um, I guess, I don't know if I want to fault the New York Times. I guess they probably picked up a, a date that was uh, just randomly a big date for us. But, I mean, you could be left with the impression that, that 
you know, things are falling apart in Arizona. But if you actually go to this website, the Arizona, it's AZDHS website, um, you can see that as of July 19th, which was two days ago, the number of cases in all of, um, I don't know if we're in Pima County or Maricopa County or the whole world. Let me just click on, okay, it did change. So this, this is by county. Uh, so on July 18th, which was, no, the July 19th, which is the last reported for uh, Pima County, we had one case of coronavirus. Now let's go to hospitalizations. So we click on hospitalizations, we go down uh, July 8th, um, not even the highest in hospitalizations, but it's been coming down, coming down, coming down, coming down. Yesterday in Pima County, there was one or two days ago, we had one hospitalization. Uh, let's look at deaths. Um, deaths right here, COVID-19 deaths. Uh, and then let's, this one I think is by state. Yeah, it doesn't change. So this is the number of deaths in the whole entire state of Arizona. It's been coming down and we're at two deaths. So um, I, so the bottom line of this is uh, uh, if these numbers are to be believed, things are, the are not, which is the transmissibility of this disease with all the conditions that are on the ground, that, and, and that means people wearing masks, but the lockdown is over. Um, the lockdown has been over for quite a long time. So uh, people are free to go out, they're free to congregate, they're free to do whatever they want to. Restaurants are open as long as they're 50% capacity. Um, we went to the restaurant uh, last week for Jennifer's birthday, uh, very safe. Um, went to another restaurant, uh, very safe. I, I think that what I'm seeing in all of this is that um, I think we're rapidly depleting coronavirus, at least this first wave. There might be a second wave, I don't know, but we're depleting the coronavirus in the state of Arizona, if these numbers are to believe. So I did some research to find out, are the numbers correct? And um, I found an article, this is from, let's find the date of it, uh, from 55 minutes ago. So it's pretty recent. Uh, let's look at that article. It says, the number of new COVID-19 cases starts to flatten in Arizona and Pima County. Arizona recently saw novel coronavirus cases plateau from one week to the next. It marks the first time cases have not increased from week to week since around the time Governor Ducey let his stay-at-home order expire on May 16th, which means that we have been in the, the stay-at-home order expired May, June, July, two months ago. New confirmed cases in Arizona totaled 27,000 from June 28th to July 4th, uh, and that was a 1% decrease. Um, new cases decrease and decrease. Here, here's the, the money quote. In recent weeks, however, the reporting lags have grown longer and longer, said Dr. Joe Gerald, an associate professor with University of Arizona's Zuckerman College of Public Health. So this professor at University of Arizona says that there's lagging going on. Um, about a week ago, for example, the total number of cases in Arizona from June 28th to July 4th looked like they decreased by 17%, um, but cases were backfilled. These backfilled cases showed the subtle week-to-week -week statewide decrease of less than 1%. Even with these reporting lags, cases do seem to be leveling out. At the same time, however, testing has slowed in the month of July. So, uh, and then there was somewhere else in here that said, um, uh, yeah, so we're at 50%. Um, it recently went from week to week, July 5th, uh, first glimmer of hope. Um, Garcia noted that Pima County is also seeing his first glimpse of a lower percentage of positive cases. Countywide, about 12% of diagnostic cases conducted between July 5th and July have come back positive, down 16%. It's nothing to brag about, but at least it's going in the right direction. Uh, somewhere in here, it talks about how long it takes from the time you get um, uh, from the time you get diagnosed, from the time you actually contract it, the time it starts to show up is about two weeks. It says so. Uh, we are well beyond two weeks uh, in the stay-at-home order. So. Uh, as I look at this, I mean, if I look at hospital, so hospitalizations, 
you would think that that would be the the most. Uh, it's a word uh, that I want to say robust, which means you have a lot of confidence in it, right? The the most uh, accurate way of predicting the coronavirus to me would be the hospitalizations because you can't really fake a hospitalization. You go to the hospital uh, because you're sick. They take your blood. They determine you have coronavirus. Now, whether or not you're in there because of coronavirus or you're in there because of something else and you just happen to have coronavirus, I'm not sure that that number shows up, but that's been the way it's been the whole entire time as you go into the hospitalization. So hospitalization is a good surrogate for all of this. And as near as I can tell, you go back to hospitalizations, we are at like, one hospitalization. Is that Pima County or is that the whole state? Nope. Okay. So one hospitalization two days ago in the whole state of Arizona, which means, my friends, that if this continues uh, as it's going, if we see this trend continue uh, for whatever reason, for a million reasons, and they'll probably debate this for the next six months, but the data doesn't lie. Well, it's, the data shouldn't lie. Assuming the data is not politicized, assuming that there is not an uh, underlying, underlying funding stream below the data to show one thing or the other, as long as all that retrain, re remains true, then we are, I believe, at least through the first wave of this thing. Uh, and it would probably not be long because I know that the people uh, at the government level uh, in the state of Arizona are monitoring this just as I am, and they're probably get even more accurate and better and quicker data than shows up on the website. But it would not surprise me uh, if this happens uh, that you will see Governor Ducey in the next day or two or three, maybe he'll wait another week just to make sure that these numbers are confirmed, um, but that you'll see kind of a celebration in the state of Arizona that we've come through at least the first wave, and there will be... Um, there will be uh, an announcement of some sort to say something. Now, what that something will be, I have no idea because I know that there's a lot of very, very powerful you know, forces always everywhere that want to use a crisis. Was, who was it that said, never let a crisis go to waste, right? So if you've got a crisis, then you should use that crisis to forward your political you know, thing that you are. It doesn't have to be political. It's whatever you want to do. Um, so... There will be forces that will negate this and you know they'll debate it and all that, but look at the numbers. Um, the numbers are looking really, 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 really good. And um, I don't know who would be against these numbers and who wouldn't want us to kind of open up more, but there are probably forces out there. And I, I mean, I don't even know who they would be because I have no idea, but there are probably forces out there that don't want us. Maybe it's the hospital lobby. Right? No, it wouldn't be the hospital lobby. Maybe it's the people that make PPP personal protective equipment. Maybe they're the ones that, no, I mean, I don't know who wouldn't celebrate this good news, all right? But I guarantee you, somebody will come out of the woodwork and will say, no, this is bad news. We can't open up, you know, um, for whatever reason. Um, maybe it's whoever's making money by staying at home. Uh, cleaning come. No, I, I mean, I don't know who it is, but I'm sure there'll be somebody. All right, so that, my friends, is, uh, is I was very excited, you know, I've been excited over the last week looking at these numbers. Uh, and then I said, yeah, but we gotta wait till Monday because you know, as I went through how long it takes to get infected to the time you actually make it to the hospital, you know, we are well past that point now. So uh, we should be seeing that if indeed, you know, we don't have a handle on this thing, we should have uh, cases rising exponentially. But whatever it is, the combination of stuff that we're doing right now seems to be working. That's the masks, that's the social distancing, that's the 50% of restaurants. But you know, I'm even looking at the data and I'm saying, I, I'm i just wondering if, you know, if the thing is just disappearing. They said in the 1918 flu that it just disappeared. <laughs> it just flat out disappeared. Um, it, whatever they were doing or however it was transmitting through society, it just disappeared. So it would not surprise me if you're gonna see an announcement in the next week uh, maybe even this week at some point, because this is all good news. All right, that's enough of the coronavirus stuff. Uh, I find it interesting. I'm sure you're probably wondering too. You probably watch different news sources than I do. I um, I typically, you know, just try to get 
local news, a couple national newses, but I don't spend a lot of time. Um, I don't like the politicized news, so I pretty much turn that off. Anything that's politicized, you know, I, I don't really watch it. To my detriment, I might add, because then sometimes I miss a big political story. Um, and that that's unfortunate too, because sometimes the political stories are just as important, um, you know, how it's how things are being portrayed in the news. But um, that's just who, you know, I, I don't like, I don't think news should be politicized. Or at least you should, if you, if you go to a news source that is politicized, you should know why they are, who they are. And, you know, I've just over time realized that certain news outlets are going to say the same thing over and over again. So, I, I mean, I don't even have to watch them. I know what they're going to say. So I don't go to them. Um, so, uh, but I, you know, the local news sources, you know, they're, they're not as politicized. And certainly, you know, local, local, like Vail, Veil Voice would not be politicized, right? Except for in the opinion section. So that's a good source of news. There you go, Lucretia. Got gotcha. you. Got gotcha. you. Little plug in for the Veil Voice. Lucretia Free is our local editor of the Veil, owner of the Veil Veil Voice. All right. So uh, that now we. I, I'm sorry it took so long, but last time we were um, we just started into Genesis 18, and Genesis 18 is a fascinating little uh, chapter in Genesis. So we're going to spend some time in Genesis 18 this morning. Um, because it really is really good. So we talked about how Abram, Abraham now, he's now Abraham and it's now Sarah, uh, was sitting in his tent at the entrance at the heat of the day and he got visitors. And since this was yesterday and since the whole chapter kind of is, uh, is part of this, we're just going to go right back to Genesis 18. We'll start at verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance to his tent to meet them, and he bowed low to the ground. Now, um, so Abraham is in his tent, and he's in the heat of the day. He's at the entrance to his tent, and he sees three men sitting there. A whole bunch of questions there because of the way he treats these three men. But... Um, one of the things that we know about Abraham is that he was part of a large tribe. He had a lot of wealth. And so when we think of tents, right, we think of the pup tent that we may have camped in when we were growing up. But if you go to some of these societies that are still tenting societies in the Middle East, and there are, I think, still few, Bedouin societies or whatever, a tent can be uh, even a palace, right? I mean, it can be a rather large thing. As a matter of fact, um, I think I have a picture of a tent. Uh, this is just one that I randomly pulled off the internet. Uh, and you can, uh, nope, that's not it. How about that? Yeah. So um, that is a, a tent that's somewhere in the world. Uh, but it, just imagine that tent and then multiply it, you know, bigger and bigger. Um, because if you live in a society where there's not a huge amount of rain, and the biggest things that you're trying to protect yourself are from dust and sun, um, then you just need to put up some shades that protect you from the dust and the sun. And, uh, you know, they can be large, open-air little things. And that's what Abraham had, was a large, open-air tent. And probably the whole compound, if you think about 319 men that went with him to go rescue his nephew Lot, and you think about those men and their wives and their children and all the servants and all the animals. I mean, we're probably talking about a 1,000 to 2,000 member strong tribe and it's all tented and uh, Abraham is in charge of it. So he's got the largest tent. He almost acts like a king in some respects uh, as we've seen here in Genesis. So this, this compound, this is a huge compound that Abraham is in charge of, and he's sitting in front uh, of his tent or near the entrance to his tent, and all of a sudden he looks up in the heat of the day, which is in the afternoon, and he sees three men. Uh, and it says uh, that in Genesis, what, what Moses calls them, because Moses is writing this, he says, the Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre. So we have right here in Genesis 18 that this is the Lord, that this is God, that this is the manifestation of God. We talked about this before. This is called a theophany. A theophany is where God takes on human form. 
and comes and communicates to mankind. So this is a theophany, no question about it. It's the Lord appeared to Abraham and he saw three men standing nearby. So uh, we'll just keep reading. Verse three, and he said, this is Abraham talking, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. And let me get you something to eat so you can be refreshed and then go on your way. And now that you've come to your servant, very well, they answered, do as you say. So uh, right here, we can see that it's singular Lord appeared to Abraham, but then it's three people and he went to meet them. And then he said to him, uh, and then Abraham said, please don't go on your way. And they said, very well, they answered, do as you say. So there's this this combination going back between three and one in this whole thing. So that is the big question is who is this theophany, right? Uh, and there's, there's two main theories, but let's just finish the rest of this and then we'll talk about those theories. We'll continue in verse six. So Abraham hurried off into his tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, get three sayas of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. And then he ran to the herd and he selected a choice tender calf, young cow, and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. And then he brought curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared, and he sets it before them, it's them again. And while they ate, he stood near them under a tree. And they asked him a question, where is your wife Sarah, they asked him. So they know that his wife's name is Sarah. Did, did, he, did he tell them that, or did they just know that going into it? Hmm, all right. Where's your wife Sarah, they, a they asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him, and Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah was through menopause, hot flashes, all that great stuff. So Sarah laughed to herself, and she thought, after I am worn out and old, my Lord is old. While I now have this pleasure to have children, um, then the Lord said to Abraham, this is again singular, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and she said, I did not laugh. But he, this one person, the little, you know, one of the three said, yes, you did laugh. So, here we have um, a couple questions that just come out right, of, right away. It's like, uh, who is this? And we know it's a theophany. There's absolutely no question from the text that this is God in human form. It's my Lord coming to uh, Abraham and, uh, and has this uh, conversation with Abraham. And um, Abraham is talking to them, uh, but it's three of them. Uh, so... Uh, you know, three is an interesting number. Three is the number of the Trinity, right? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, in the creation story, we saw that it wasn't God, El, but it was Elohim. It was many, it was the plural form of God, but that he created the heavens and the earth. So um, this is Genesis. This is before, you know, Christ is on the earth. So Moses would have no idea about Jesus. And yet the way he writes it is about three people. So just a couple comments. First of all, we know it's a theophany. We know it's God in human form. Um, the two competing theses here, the two competing ideas are, number one, that this is a Trinitarian depiction of God. It's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Somehow um, God took flesh into three and came and visited Abraham. Now, that theory or that idea behind Genesis 18 actually was not part of early Christianity. In early Christianity, uh, the idea was that it was God in the flesh and two angels. So when God shows up, he shows up to Abraham with two angels. And that is what the early church, pretty much from the time that they were, uh, you know, enacted in, in Acts 2 
uh, until maybe the third or fourth or fifth century, there was no writing whatsoever, an early church father, that said it was anything else than Jesus Christ so God taking human form, so he would look like Jesus or perhaps somebody else, but they said it was Jesus uh, and two angels going with him. And there is a reason why they would say that. And the first is when we get to Genesis 19, uh, this same crowd of people go over to Sodom and they look over at the town of Sodom. And it says in Genesis 19 that it's angels at that point, but it's only two angels which is interesting. So all that taken together, the early church, and I agree with them, uh, is that it's God in human form, it's Jesus and two angels with him. Uh, that is kind of how I view this theophany, that it's, that it's Jesus and two angels, or it's, it's God in human flesh, which, okay, it looks like Jesus, because when God takes human flesh, he looks like Jesus. Uh, and they're the ones that are coming in and talking to Abraham. And, uh, I find that fascinating. So what happens? So Abraham, for whatever reason, I mean, another reason is that there must have been something about the man in the middle, right? You've got the man in the middle plus the two servants. Now, I'm sure Abraham had visitors all the time. I mean, people probably came through, and but there was something unique about this visitation from these three. So I'm thinking that it's God in the middle and the two angels kind of, acting as his servants or his messengers or you know whatever the the other two guys are they're probably pointing out the glory of the guy in the middle which is Jesus and so when they show up it's almost an instant um, indication to Abraham that this guy is somebody special I need to go I need to get him something to, to drink I need to wash their you know somewhere to wash their feet I need to kill the the, the little calf I need to have curds and milk, and I need to treat them like royalty. There must have been something about the way that they presented themselves for Abraham to immediately recognize that this is the Lord. And, and so he does. He treats them with incredible respect and does you know throws out the red carpet for them. Uh, there's no question about it. And so uh, then they make this amazing, remarkable prediction, which is that they're going to come back in a year. And when they come back in a year... Sarah is going to be pregnant uh, through that year, and she's going to have a son. And, of course, Sarah hears all this in the tent, and she starts laughing like, you got to be kidding me. I mean, how would you feel if you were well past childbearing age and somebody told you, hey, you're going to have a kid in a year? I mean, you probably would laugh. I don't blame Sarah for laughing. I mean, laughing is part of the story. Sarah should laugh. But when she's called to the carpet on it by the guy in the middle and says, why are you laughing? She, sa she denies it. She says, I didn't laugh. Which is, now if you take this at its face value, then that means that Sarah is lying to God. Uh, which, uh, you know, there's two people you should never lie to, apparently. One is Congress and the other is God, right? And um, so Sarah chose to lie and hide it um, and, but the guy in the middle doesn't doesn't seem to um, to really call Sarah onto the carpet for lying to him. It's funny. Uh, he just says, yes, you did laugh. Um, just points out that she lied. And I find that fascinating. There was no, uh, you know, because you lied to me, I'm going to, uh, you know, have your toes fall off. Or because you lied to me, I'm going to turn your skin green. Or... Because you lied to me, you're going to have a son, but you're not going to have any grandsons or something like that. Um, for whatever reason, the, the guy in the middle, this Lord, says, yes, you laughed. And that's what he left it at. And Sarah now knows um, that this guy uh, must be something important because he not only knows her name, he knows that she's going to bear a child, he knows that she was laughing, he knows all this about her, and gives this promise that you're going to have a child. And she does have a child. Uh, and the name of the child is reflected in this story. So um, that happens in Genesis 3. They get this, this theophany. And uh, of course you could ask the question, do we get theophanies from God today? Do people get theophanies? Um, I know that there are some people that say that they see God uh, there are very many Catholics that say they see the Virgin Mary. 
Um, there were even some other people. I remember Oral Roberts saying that he saw a 75 foot Jesus once, and it was a 75 foot Jesus that told him that he should build Oral Roberts University, which is this big medical center. And uh, he was able to, you know, raise the money for that because he went around telling people that he saw a 75 foot Jesus and that Jesus told him to do that. And that's a very, very powerful image in your head to go around and raise money for a hospital by saying, well, I saw Jesus come down. You know, I don't know if that would be a theophany or if that would be a vision. It's probably more of a vision. Um, and, you know, you're probably saying to yourself, man, I wish God would come to me in a vision, right? I wish God would come to me in a vision and tell me what to do. But that is a double-edged sword because if God comes to you in a vision uh, and tells you what to do, A, you have to do it. You have no choice. Uh, if God uh, tells you in a vision to do something, you, it's best not to go against what God is telling you to do. Uh, and so when you when he comes in a vision, make sure it's a vision, you know, test. And then there's other, you know, and Paul says, you know, whenever, you know, you hear the Lord speaking to you, test those spirits, right? Um, go back through scripture, see if that's all part of scripture or not, and make sure that what you're hearing is truly uh, in line with God and what he's already said through his word. And if what he's said through his word lines up with what he's telling you, um, you know, then it's, then you are free to do that. Um, and if you, if you truly believe that it is from God, you're free to believe that also. Um, but the double-edged sword of a part of it is now, uh, you have to be potentially mocked and ridiculed. Uh, I don't know if Oral Roberts was, I'm sure he had to have been because he went around telling people that he saw a vision of a 75-foot Jesus to build Oral Roberts University. And I'm sure there had to have been people mocking him at the time saying, well, you didn't see God, that didn't happen, that sort of thing. And of course, I have no idea whether or not that was just a marketing scheme or whether or not he truly did see a 75-foot Jesus. That is something way, 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 way beyond my understanding and possibility of understanding uh, the only know, uh, way I'll know that is at the end of time when, when I see Jesus face to face, I can ask him that and about 18 million other questions that I have for him. Got a list going on in my head and uh, I will definitely, but I believe that when we get to heaven, it'll all be laid out for us. I believe that heaven is going to be basically following all the different ways that God had it under control, like this coronavirus thing that's going on, you know, we're we're afraid about it, but God's got it under control. He knows what's going to happen. He knows how it's all going to end up, and he's got it. There's, he, We're safe in his hands. Um, there's no reason to worry about it. I mean, it's fun to watch about it. It's no fun to stay home. You know, it's no fun to wear the, wear the face mask. You know, it does cause a huge inconvenience in our life. But the one thing that we should never, ever, ever worry about is does God have it under control? God has it under control. God has everything under control. Everything that happens, he's able to use for his good. And so right now in the midst of a pandemic, God is able to use this for his good uh, in the world around him. And that's a hope that we all cling to. And he's able to use his church to love the world around him too. So that's another thing that we're called to do. All right, so that pretty much ends Genesis uh, 18 verses one to 15. Um, now, the, the, there's another part to Genesis 18, and that's this discussion with these three men about Sodom and Gomorrah. And you've all heard about Sodom and Gomorrah and that whole entire story. And um, you probably have some things in your mind about what that story was really all about. And um, we're gonna, we're gonna probably, I'm gonna challenge you on what that story is, what it's truly about, and why uh, Moses put that story in there, why God the, did the things he did, um, that is, you, are, you won't want to miss that one because that is, that'll be a, a money day. And that'll be tomorrow, which is Wednesday, which is hump day. Um, so uh, I guess we'll probably end it right there. Um, so if you wouldn't mind joining me with prayer, that would be great. Gracious God, um, thank you for the blessings of this day. Thank you for uh, the numbers that are looking good on the coronavirus. And we pray that you would be with those who have to make decisions based upon these numbers. Um, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over us and our, our little, uh, you know, South Tucson 
Arizona, United States, and the world. Uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, that ends the first half of Genesis 17. And I just pray that you have an awesome day, wonderful day in the Lord. And we will get together tomorrow. And uh, until then, God keep you in his grace. Take care. Bye.